Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. My name is Francoise Johalem, and I am the co-chair of the care team for the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of San Miguel de Allende. The other co-chair is John Wolf. Our care team has more than a dozen members, depending on the time of the year. Before COVID-19, we mostly helped members who were recovering from surgery or an illness by organizing visits, bringing food, offering assistance and comfort. We especially keep an eye on and care for members who live alone here in San Miguel. Because of COVID-19, we no longer make home visits, but we do stay in touch with vulnerable persons, checking on them, sending food if needed, and making sure that their helpers wear masks and follow the recommendations of our COVID-19 task force. We have organized and co-sponsored a series of educational workshops which have been very well attended. You can access all of this on YouTube by going to the main site of uufsma.org. These have been all free, but we have asked you to please make a contribution to the Minister's Discretionary Fund. So I'm asking you again, again to also to please make a contribution and I'm putting that information, I will put that information in the chat box. Originally, this workshop was planned for just our care team, but we realized that there was a lot of information that would be valuable to many. So we decided to open it up to the fellowship. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce my friend, Dr. Stephanie Studensky. I met Stephanie a few years ago in Baltimore through a program called the BLSC, the Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging. It is a clinical research program on human aging that is more than 60 years old. It is under the National Institute on Aging, which is part of the National Institute of Health. It is America's longest running scientific study on human aging. The study population is a series of healthy volunteers of different ages who join the study and come to Baltimore to undergo a battery of tests every four, two, or one year, depending on age. Participants are evaluated for many physical elements as well as for brain function. Physical tests are given, information on mood, personality, and social aspects of life is also collected. The goal of the program is to characterize the many aspects of the aging process and to learn how people can successfully adapt to aging. It has contributed more than any other research project to our understanding of aging. I feel very lucky to have been a participant in the program for 12 years, and I continue to go to Baltimore now yearly to undergo a battery of tests. I usually stay in a hospital for three days, and then I go on to John Hopkins for some neuroimaging uh, study of my brain. I met Stephanie Studensky when she was a director of the program. I was waiting for my testing, and she came to chat with us participants. I told her about my spending the winters in San Miguel, and she was intrigued. She came that January and fell in love with the town. A couple of years later, she retired, and she and her husband now spend most of the year in San Miguel. So Stephanie will give you a PowerPoint presentation. I think uh, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. There are four different sections. Uh, she will tell you more about that. Uh, now I just want to give you a little bit about uh, Stephanie's background. Uh, when I asked her for her resume, uh, it was 41 pages. <laughs> so this is a mini, mini resume. She's a nurse and a physician who is board certified in internal medicine, rheumatology, and geriatrics. Her 40-year professional career in academic medicine included clinical practice in hospital, outpatient, long-term care, and home visit setting. 
She developed and taught courses about aging to students ranging from high school through all levels of health professionals and graduate students. Her research focus on aging and physical function with a special interest in movement and the brain. She was principal investigator for multiple, uh, multi, for multiple multidisciplinary NIH grants and she served as a member of the advisory council to the National Institute on Aging. She has been the keynote speakers at conferences across Europe, Asia, North and South America, Australia and New Zealand. She dedicated her career to developing and testing ways to help older adults stay as independent and fulfilled as possible. So we are very lucky to have you, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Thanks, Francoise, and welcome everyone. I especially want to thank Francoise and Diana for doing the work to make this possible. Many of you may know that um, we were going to do this in person back in March. And um, I was very inspired by Tom Rosiello's perspective on what we were trying to do. And he wanted to emphasize that we are in community partnership with each other, that we are in service to each other. And for us to think about our advice in that context, in terms of how we can create for ourselves a set of skills and knowledge that will allow us to support our community. Um, Diana, can you start the PowerPoint or is it somewhere? There it is. The things I wanted to suggest to uh, you today are that I did it as a PowerPoint because I have a lot of um, graphical pictures of things that might be useful to you. And um, I think if anyone actually wants the PowerPoint, uh, you can ask me or Diana and we can send it to you. This would be in addition to um, uh, a handout that I'll tell you more about later. I see we have on the call many people who have professional or personal experience working with a wide range of vulnerable people. And I'm hoping this will be a conversation, not just me talking. I'm eager to have your input for you to share your ideas and suggestions as we go through these ideas about how to be in service. So we've set this up. So we're going to stop and have a chance to ask questions, make comments uh, at multiple points uh, as we go through the talk. Um, Diana, can you give me the next slide? Yeah. So here's some topics. Um, we're going to spend most of our time on the practical things about how we work with each other. But I thought very incredibly briefly, I just wanted to start with a big picture of um, how we think about health and aging. And then a number of ways that we uh, can conceive of vulnerability and uh, its impact. Uh, some practical ideas about markers and red flags for uh, problems that might be coming up. And then a good bit on tools and strategies for people with various kinds of health challenges in terms of having successful interactions. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about where you can learn more. So Diana, next slide, please. Uh, I could do a whole talk on this, but we're going to make it really, really short. I think the challenge for those of us who uh, work in the field of aging is that classically medicine focuses on one organ system at a time. You, you know, you have your heart specialists and your liver specialists, et cetera. And so it's quite fragmented. Whereas we think of health and well-being in older people, depending not only on the health conditions you have, but on how your systems work with each other. Uh, and we also realize that 
with aging, there are subtle changes in many systems that don't really become diseases, but affect how one copes and manages with um, situations that develop in life. And we're very aware that there are many uh, psychological, emotional, environmental, social factors that um, affect how we deal with various challenges we face in our life. And so instead of just thinking of people as a list of their diseases or diagnoses, we tend to want to think of um, the best indicators of well-being in late life are kind of how the whole person is doing. Uh, we think about various um, markers of whole body function as well as um, activities. So again, there's a really lot of science behind all of this. If um, anyone wants to hear more about the exciting new developments and a whole philosophy of how we look at aging. But let's go on to the more practical thing. Diana, next slide, please. So we said we're working with vulnerable older adults, but what do we mean by that? Uh, first of all, none of us are invulnerable. None of us are super people, but some people are more vulnerable than others. And there are a variety of things that make people more vulnerable, uh, which often means um, at higher risk for having a hard time with stressors or challenges. So people with many medical conditions can be at higher risk. People who are frail, and we're gonna talk about how people think about or define what that is and pe some people who are disabled. Next slide, Diana. So this is the thing where you have a bunch of conditions. Um, the doctors call this your problem list and they print it out when you go to the primary care doctor. And some people would say the more of them you have, the more likely you are to be vulnerable. But amazingly, there are lots of people with a whole list of problems on their medical problem list who are active and vigorous and doing really well. And there are people who have almost no conditions who are quite vulnerable. Sometimes they are the very elderly. So this, this graphic here is just pointing out that vulnerability is made up of different components or way of thinking about it. And they don't overlap. So we're in this graphic, comorbidity is the same as this multi-morbidity bunch of diseases. And you can have it and be disabled or not and be frail or not. So um, Diana, next slide, please. So here's this other component of frailty. Oh, you went up two, go back one to frail. Um, so again, this is an element of vulnerability, but you can have this without a lot of diseases or disability or with them. Uh, like many aspects of vulnerability, people who have markers of frailty are at higher risk for hospitalization, complications from health problems, while people we think of as robust are at lower risk. People measure frailty in a variety of different ways. In my world, everybody argues about this, but um, the idea is that you can kind of look at a person and talk to them and get a sense of how frail they are. And markers include um, being weak, being tired, being slow, not moving around much, and shrinking. And so perhaps the lady uh, in the top picture would be considered sort of a classic example of someone who looks pretty frail. Um, these questions can be addressed um, by asking people themselves how they're doing, or there are a variety of um, measurement tools that people use for this. And I included one of these in that resource handout that um, Diana shared with you. Diana, next slide, please. So a third aspect of vulnerability is disability, which in my world we define as needing help with daily functional activities, such as getting dressed and bathing or home management, um, such as paying bills, managing groceries, uh, 
other things like that. And again, it's important to remember there are uh, disabled people who are not frail or multi, don't have a lot of conditions. So these are aspects, but they are not identical. Uh, next slide, Diana. So overall, what is this thing we call vulnerable? It's being more um, uh, vulnerable or having a lower tolerance to illnesses, accidents, uh, medication side effects, social emotional stressors, and things like frailty, disability, and multimorbidity increase vulnerability. And they do it by two concepts I want to briefly address called reserve and resilient. So you think of reserve as the extra you have going for you beyond what you need to just sit there. And you can think about this at the body system level, the organ system level. It's how much more your heart can do than um, just what it's doing while you're resting. Uh, it's the same with your kidneys and your lung. It's um, extra capacity beyond what you need um, at a resting state. And it can be at the whole system level too. And so we often, in my world, for example, in the studies that, that um, Francois participated in, we look at how much more you can move um, than uh, just sitting. We see what kind of demanding mental activities you're able to be involved in. So it's this extra capacity um, I guess it's like the camel's hump. It's stored there for when you need it. And then resilience is um, how quickly you're able to recover or at least not decline after any kind of stressful event or demand. So it's this um, seesaw where, I don't know if you can see me pointing, you could have a stressor that is so severe that no matter how much reserve you were, how invulnerable you thought you were, you can't tolerate it. And so you get hit by a truck, the stressor can be overwhelming. But for many stressors, they are um, able to be resisted by these various forms of reserve. And so what we're looking for is the more reserve you have, the better you are able to tolerate the stressors and therefore the more resilient you'll be. So one of the things I think we can talk about is um, how do we help build reserve and resilience in our community? Next slide, Diana. So I'm just pointing out here that um, I've been my career has been in uh, medicine and physiology, and um, there's a lot of really important information there, but resilience depends on many things beyond what we call here physical resilience. So for example, uh, many psychosocial factors, genetics, uh, these reserve life experiences and environment all influence how resilient you are, which suggests um, how much you be able to tolerate stress. And uh, on your right here is just pointing out that there are many, many aspects of uh, psychological well-being that are really, really important for uh, resilience and reducing vulnerability. So I thought we might stop here for a sec and see if we have any input suggestions, comments, um, yeah, I how don't do you see anything. this? Yes, Francois? Yeah, I don't have anything in the chat room yet, but... Um, well, let's stop for a sec. Uh, anyone, uh, when you think of vulnerability, do you have other perspectives? Um, I know we have experts, particularly in psychological and social issues. Um, so you can unmute yourself if you want to answer. Just unmute yourself. Oh, hi, this is Susan. But I think that there are ways to create buffers for people where they can be aware of where the, the minimum involvement and intervention with the person can get you the most bang for their buck. Um, for some people, it's so simple as sleep. For other people, it's sleep and nutrition. 
For some, it's pushing, it's doing heavy, large muscle work that helps them to maintain a mental state that's calming. For other, it's, it's having a time out from electronics and centering. For some, it's dancing. Um, how, how what we have already can be built as opposed to us constantly treating what was wrong. So that's kind of my sense for resilience is how do we frame the, the picture to begin with and then to begin to interact with somebody to focus on their strengths and see what falls out of the apple tree um, from there to be dealt with. Anyway, I talk a lot, so that's it. Well, thank you. And that fits really well with um, where we're going to be heading here. So let's get that PowerPoint back up. So we follow people oftentimes across um, various stressors, health events, uh, personal experiences uh, when we're part of the care team. And um, one of the ways we see how people are tolerating stress or recovering from a difficulty, uh, which we mean resilience, is to um, follow their function and aspects of frailty. And so, for example, in my practice, um, I would be looking for how things are going over time in a person's ability to manage self-care and home. So if a person um, came home from the hospital and um, in a few days they were, um, oh, looking perkier, uh, maybe fixing their hair, putting on lipstick, um, I would feel like they were uh, recovering. And if someone kind of uh, stopped taking an interest in their personal hygiene. They had food spilled on their clothes and um, weren't combing their hair. I would be more concerned. Same thing with horse, house organi home organization and housekeeping. Um, and you're looking for change. You know, some of us are neater than others. And so it's not an absolute what kind of a housekeeper you are. But if someone who's usually meticulous stops washing the dishes or putting things away, that might be a sign that they're becoming a problem. Uh, people losing track of uh, responsibilities like uh, paying bills, uh, people who usually like to cook or prepare meals who aren't uh, doing that anymore. So I think you can see people who are on a great trajectory of uh, recovery who are uh, in a positive direction in these kinds of function areas. Uh, and you can keep an eye for people who are not improving or getting into more difficulty. Same thing for some of these frailty things. I think um, what we're looking for is that people, for example, who, who frequently um, lose weight and shrink when they're sick, that they're feeling like eating again. They have an appetite. They're filling out a little bit. For activity, they're doing a little more. They're, they're getting out of the chair and moving around more. Those would be signs of resilience that they're improving. Whereas um, if, if they're less active, if they're more tired, this would be a marker that I was more concerned. And the same thing in terms of um, markers of change uh, in um, cognitive status and other aspects of mental health, we can see how motivated and engaged people are. Are they interested in life and um, participating or are they withdrawing? Um, uh, are they uh, in, in paying attention in uh, daily life? So again, we think of resilience as what's happening over time um, in terms of function and frailty after a stressor. I thought maybe some of you um, had other markers that you use in your interactions with people. How do you tell if you think somebody's getting better or getting in trouble? Does anyone want to comment? I, I'd like to comment a little bit about that because my <clears throat> background and training as a clinical social worker has a lot to do with the treatment of substance abuse. And so um, 
one of the markers, uh, unfortunately, there is a lot of problems for um, the elderly with substance abuse. And in particular, in the area of alcoholism and um, the use of prescription drugs, um, especially pain medication. And that's where they can get into trouble. Um, and so I would want to be uh, in, in the time of COVID, uh, unfortunately, some people can kind of lapse back into some bad habits and uh, start to rely on things that uh, really don't help them and um, they need. And since a, a lot of people are isolated, uh, they may be um, slipping back into those patterns without anybody else around to say, hey, you know, I think I've noticed that you're drinking more or, uh, you know, um, or, are you using those, are you using your pain medications correctly? That kind of thing. Um, so how, do you, how would you suspect that someone was getting in trouble? What kind of behavioral markers? Well, if, uh, if I were, I mean, it's kind of difficult right now if you're, if you can't see someone, but if you were able to see that person, uh, and you noticed that uh, maybe their words were slurred, uh, their, um, uh, their gait was different, uh, um, maybe uh, they were uh, a little more irritable, uh, uh, angry, uh, not able to uh, continue in a conversation clearly. Um, and maybe you hear from other people that these people are having a difficult time communicating with them uh, because of um, their speech is slurred, that kind of thing. Um, it could mean that that person is, is maybe having some trouble. Okay. Uh, so. So, yeah, thank you. I, I do think that in the day, in these days of FaceTime <laughs> and other video communication that we can um, do some of those observations of, you know and if you're on the phone you can hear some of it let's let's go on to the next one thank you i, I would like to ask diana to remove the powerpoint when someone is speaking so that we can see the person who is speaking okay let's go back yeah the red flag so um i think we feel some responsibility when we're in these um, supporting relationships in our community. Sometimes we worry about how someone is doing. And this is just a slide to talk about, um, you know, how do you sort of sort between, yeah, they're not doing that great. And this is something I should um, bring up as a more urgent issue. So these are examples of the kinds of red flags we use in practices like geriatric. Again, there may be people who have other red, red flags they use in um, their work with vulnerable older people. But I think taking to bed, not wanting to get out of bed uh, as a new thing worries me. Um, we talk about um, for cognitive status, getting lost uh, is, is a very worrisome accidental fires, forgetting to turn off um, the burners on the stove, um, acute confusion, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute, uh, falls with injury and uh, not wanting to eat anymore. So these are some examples. I'm going to do a few more slides, but then I am interested in how other people, um, what you have in your mind for um, things that you would consider to be markers of the need to take action, maybe. Um, Diana, let's do some more. So this is um, delirium as it's looked at in my world. Um, the point is, is that um, it's a recent and reasonably substantial change. And so people who have dementia 
can be confused. Um, they can wax and wane a little. People do have good days and bad days, but um, I think delirium is often more marked. Uh, so you can have delirium on top of dementia, but anyone can get delirium if they get sick enough. So uh, healthy, completely intact people who are very ill in the ICU often get delirious. Um, but um, more vulnerable people can get delirious with a much smaller stressor. So there's these four key parts of what we call delirium. This thing's called the confusion assessment method, developed about 20 years ago, acute onset and fluctuating course. So the idea is, is that it's uh, a, a substantial change from what the person is usually like. And delirium is not the same all day. So people often, they say sundowning, they seem better in the morning, they get worse at night. Um, inattention, so uh, not focusing, uh, being easily distracted, uh, having trouble keeping track of what's being said, disorganized thinking, uh, or rambling, irrele irrelevant conversation, illogical flow of ideas, switching from subject to subject, and altered level of consciousness. Um, in the hospital, the nurses mostly notice what they call these hyper alert delirium because they're noisy and hard to take care of. And so delirium is often missed in the hospital because there's a whole world of quiet delirium where they're not yelling, they're not fighting. Uh, they don't have any idea what's going on, um, but they're quiet. And so being both overactive and underactive um, in the context of these uh, cognitive uh, changes is markers of delirium. Then there's a whole world you can talk about um, risk factors, management. Uh, it's a, a whole talk in and of itself. Um, next slide, Diana. Yeah, yeah, we're here. Okay. Um, oh, we could stop for a minute. Does anyone um, want to share anything about red flags as you see them? Markers of um, urgent concerns. How about if the person is very argumentative? you ask them to do something for their own good and they keep arguing with you and they get very angry. Yeah, I think the issue is whether that's chronic or acute. <laughs> if they're always like that, um, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about um, the frustration we have when we worry about people and, and they don't seem to be interested in doing what we want. and. That's a very, very difficult part of our practice. But I would say in the context of a red flag, uh, which means somebody that you've been following and you're like, uh oh, there's a big problem here. Um, unless it was sudden, they were usually easy to get along with and all of a sudden they're, they have a big change in behavior. I would worry that they were getting sick or something was happening. Back. Go ahead. One of, one of the things that came to mind in terms of what was previously saying, being said about substance abuse, your warnings of your um, signs, warning signs, are all indications potentially of substance abuse. Um, they can also, a lot of this, be the result of a depression caused by the onset of loss. Um, unfortunately, as we get older, um, we're, as you know, we're biologically built to depressed the old gorilla syndrome. And so you can get all of that, the argumentation, whatever. What I would be most concerned about, given any of the above, is a person's balance being off, potentially having fallen, not even identified the impact, and all of those are also signs of concussion. So that's just my little bit of input. Yeah. Right, I think altered mental status um, in a person we're following could have a variety of serious causes that um, might be a, a, a red flag. 
Let's go back to that slide. Um, it says tools and strategies. So this is going to be a pretty practical part of the talk. Um, make sure that we think about how, when we're interacting with people, how we can make that as successful as possible, especially in terms of communication. So we're going to do um, changes in hearing, vision, cognition, and mobility. Diana, next slide. So. Many, many, many people uh, have hearing loss with aging, uh, the medical words, presbycusis. Um, you can have um, this age-related hearing loss, uh, not only in the inner ear, but also in the pathways uh, that go to the hearing-related brain areas. Um, some of you may know in your own life, I know in mine, um, that I have trouble with speech discrimination, especially in noisy environments. I can't hear what people are saying. Um, classically, age-related hearing loss <clears throat> is much worse for high sounds than low sounds. And so what you have here is this, um, this is the kind of hearing testing uh, that we can do in the office. This thing on the y-axis, the vertical axis, is how loud it is. So up at the top is quieter and down at the bottom is louder. And from left to right is from is the frequency which goes from very low sounds to very high sounds. So again, what you see is age-related hearing loss is typically for these high, high pitch voices, high sounds. Um, people who do screening uh, in the clinic, which is very easy to do, um, will just take um, kind of a medium uh, frequency and a medium loudness and if you can hear that they would get harder or easier. Something simple you can do um, if you want, if a person is concerned about their hearing or if you want to make sure they can hear you well, is ask the person to close their eyes and whisper, can you tell me your name? Tell me your name. And if they don't hear you and tell you your name, then um, they're probably sight reading and doing other things. And um, you may want to consider other things you can do to improve communication. So we can go on to the next slide. Here's some thoughts about things to do if you're working with a person with hearing loss. Uh, first is uh, to minimize background noise. So we talked about how much trouble people hearing speech if there's a lot of sounds in the background Another thing we often do in home visits or clinics is use some sort of device where you actually put earphones or earplugs um, in people's ears and you talk directly to them. We used to do this with little audio enhancers, but nowadays you can get an app for your cell phone that does this. Um, remember that um, people with age-related hearing loss can hear better if you talk in a low voice and if you talk in a high voice. And so if you're yelling and your voice goes up, you can actually be self-defeating. You want to use a lower voice. Many people who have some trouble hearing tend to um, help themselves by watching your mouth when they're talking. So you want to make sure they can see your face and your mouth. You want to have good lighting on your face. You want to speak clearly. And I, um, I don't know if you've been seeing, um, they are now making masks that have a window so that you can see your mouth. So um, I think this is, you can see a person smile too, but um, this might be particularly helpful if you are uh, having to wear a mask around somebody. I think it's always fine to ask the person if they can hear you well and uh, in a very permissive way saying, you know, am I speaking in a way that you can hear well? And uh, if not, you can adjust your voice, the lighting. And then I wanted, I, I have a thing in my resources page about some of the smartphone apps for audio enhancement, which I think are very cool. We can go on to the next slide. A little bit about vision loss with aging. Um, 
you know, when we talk about vision loss, they talk about legal blindness. Many of you have probably seen these Snellen eye charts. Legally blind is you can't make out that E. Low vision is you have trouble with this third level around the TOZ. And this is with your best correction. Many of us can't see much without our glasses on, but this is with the best correction. So there's two main types of age-related visual loss, macular degeneration and glaucoma. It's important to remember these days people um, get checked for the very earliest stages of these conditions. And so you can have glaucoma for years without vision loss and you can have early macular degeneration without major problems. And with management, many of these conditions are stable for years. So not everybody with macular degeneration and glaucoma has serious um, low vision and legal blindness. But some people do. Some people have um, real impact on what they can see. And so the main point here is what, what it does to your di vision differs a lot between macular degeneration and glaucoma. Macular degeneration affects the cells in the middle of the back of the eye, the retina. And so it is worse in the middle and much clearer around the edge. Before it gets this bad, it's often just wavy in the middle, things like that. Um, Glaucoma is the opposite. You can see pretty good in the middle, but you can't, you have narrow range of vision. You can't see the edges as well. We can go on to the next slide. So things to think about with um, people um, who have uh, vision loss. Uh, there's a whole world of um, interacting with people who um, really are legally blind. And the idea is you always identify yourself um, so they know you're there. Um, and that they don't see your nonverbal facial expressions, so you want to use verbal rather than nonverbal commentary to share emotional issues or other things like that. Um, that um, you can use your voice and uh, touch to help people locate where are you around them. Uh, for people with low vision, full light without glare can really help them see better. Um, again, make sure people can see your face. Um, I see people in many settings and sometimes they don't know where the glasses are. Or the hospital lost the glasses. So um, finding people's visual corrective devices and having them on can really help with confusion and communication. Uh, a mistake many of us make is we speak louder to somebody who can't see. And if there's no problem with your hearing, you don't have to yell at people who can't see. Um, uh, if you remember the different patterns of visual loss, it's important to remember that the glaucoma people can't see the edges. So if, if you move around to the side, from their point of view, you disappear. If you don't stay right where they're looking, um, they can't see you. Uh, people with the central loss, the macular degeneration, sometimes can see you better if they don't look at you because their edge version is better than looking right at you. So if somebody's looking at you like this, it's not because they think you're weird. It's because that's where they can see. Um, let's go on to the next. Again, humongous topic. People have conferences with thousands of specialists. They, you know, gigantic. So we're going to be brief here, do a little defining and then a little bit about communicating. So when people talk about dementia, uh, what they mean is that you have to have a substantial loss in memory, but not just memory. You also have to have cognitive problems in other areas of thinking, including things like language, problem solving, abstract thinking. And to be dementia, it has to affect your ability to manage yourself, daily functioning ability. And so the criteria, the diagnostic criteria for dementia include 
more than one domain of cognitive dysfunction plus an impact on daily functioning. Uh, I think we've all been taught to call dementia Alzheimer's disease, uh, another topic I could talk a lot about. But in most older people, the cause of, of dementia is mixed. It's a mix of vascular problems, the protein problems of Alzheimer, plus other things. It's not pure Alzheimer's. Um, obviously, there are many stages in dementia um, from early to quite late. You can get definitions for all of that. But I think especially, and we see this a lot in older people with mixed dementia, they progress more slowly. They spend years being kind of forgetful, needing a little help, but they, they don't necessarily have um, a drastic course. So the natural history of dementia can vary a lot. Um, there are many, many screening tests. These are not diagnostic tests. These are just first steps and looking to see if someone has a meaningful loss of cognitive function. One is called the Montreal uh, Cognitive Assessment, or MOCA, and it includes all these main domains. Um, I have a sample of it in your resources and tools. You may be aware of that's the one that Mr. Trump says shows that he's so sharp. It doesn't do that. It just finds out if you have a serious problem. So again, um, I, I gave you some URLs and handouts that explain uh, more about how dementia is diagnosed and what these components are. Next slide, please. There is a, a, a term for a condition that is sort of in between being cognitively intact and being demented that they call mild cognitive impairment, MCI. There's several forms. Um, some are memory only. Some are some of these other uh, calculations, language only. But in all these people, they pretty much are still okay taking care of themselves. And one of the things that's important to remember uh, about people who get a diagnosis of MCI is that as we've been studying this now for 15 plus years, there is an increased risk that a higher proportion of people with MCI will go on to dementia compared to cognitively intact people. But we regularly see people who stay at the MCI level indefinitely. And I have seen people who go from MCI back to normal. So it is not a one-way street. Um, again, they tend to test memory. They tend to test these things about problem solving. Uh, and um, something I'm very interested in is this idea of processing speed, which is sort of your ability to um, take information and act on it uh, in a prompt manner. And a very common test for this is called the digit symbol substitution test, DSST. And I gave you a sample of that um, in that resources handout as well, just for your curiosity. But I feel that um, slowing thinking is, is in my mind an important marker of changes in brain health. Next, next slide. This is just briefly here because I know we all worry that we're getting demented. And so um, this is a classic um, way to distinguish what might be called age-related cognitive decline that is not dementia and symptoms that indicate dementia. And one is functioning independently, pursuing normal activities, despite occasional memory lapses, like I have, as opposed to difficulty performing simple tasks. Uh, for, um, I think a really important marker is forgetting how to do things you've done many times. Um, I have a, a family mom member who's quite irreverent, and um, her spouse is endlessly forgetful. He doesn't remember anything. But he, um, he's, he's the handyman around the house. And she asked me, how will I know when he's demented he doesn't remember anything? And I said, when he can't fix stuff anymore. Because that's what shows his brain is working. So normal cognitive, age-related cognitive decline 
you can remember when you couldn't remember. So um, you say, oh, I couldn't, I couldn't find that word. I, I forgot where I put my keys. Whereas people who are having dementia don't know they're forgetting things. Um, uh, normal, might need to remind directions, but doesn't get lost. Getting lost in familiar places is more dementia. Occasional word finding, um, but able to hold a conversation is normal. Um, garbled, misused words um, is more dementia. And then judgment and decision-making ability are about the same as normal in age-related cognitive problems, whereas dementia can show poor judgment and trouble making choices. So let's go on to the next one. So just some thoughts about working with a person with dementia. Um, people can be at very different stages. In early dementia, um, people are um, very much themselves. And um, uh, I think that it is respectful and appropriate to not change your behavior at all. So if a person can have a conversation and is enjoying it, I don't think you should be patronizing. I don't think you should simplify your language. Just be yourself. On the other hand, if people have trouble with understanding and attention, they have more moderate or advanced dementia, you can speak more slowly and clearly and one subject at a time. Um, I think probably all of us know, but I'm going to mention it because I see family members making this mistake. It doesn't help to tell someone who's demented that you already told them something. They don't remember and it, it, it doesn't get you anywhere. So arguing, criticizing, correcting don't help at all with a person who has really substantial dementia. Um, if you're trying to interact with somebody, you want to try to minimize distractions. Um, you want to uh, identify topics that a person enjoys. Uh, many times um, these will be uh, older memories, which are more likely to be intact. So past interests and experiences or real time present thing. This is why sometimes people with dementia enjoy doing uh, craft activities and other things like that and also enjoy interacting with um, pets, children. And again, I think we all do, but remember that um, we are still individual souls and it is, it is e not quite easy, but one can accidentally get patronizing with people who are demented. And uh, it's important to try very hard to maintain a high level of respect. Next slide. So again, I could talk all day about this, um, but um, I think the idea is that this is really critical for independence for many people and uh, problems with mobility are a threat to independence in many older people. So um, mobility limitations can affect many aspects of life. We c I could go on and on about the many um, physiologic changes, conditions uh, that contribute to mobility limitations. Some of the simplest ways of thinking about it are um, whether one can, is bedridden, uh, wheelchair bound, needs a walker, uses a cane. Um, there's a whole world of mobility that's about balance and stability. Um, that can, uh, people who feel unsteady are uh, afraid to move around a lot, um, need to hold on to things and restrict their activity. So a whole nother world here. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. So just some of the things you can think about if you're working with a person with mobility limitations. Many people with mobility limitations know when they need help and they can tell you. So if you are physically present, you can ask a person to tell you how you can help. Um, if you're working regularly and in the physical presence of a person with a significant mobility limitation, you can learn how to help with safe transfers and walking. You don't wanna do this if you don't know how because you can hurt yourself, but they are simple techniques and um, 
you can really help with the safety of someone if you know a little bit about how to spot them, support them, and help them with their movement. Um, when I do home visits, and maybe someday when we're doing them again, <clears throat> I think rather than just giving someone a lecture about how to make their home safe, what's really helpful is to go around the house with the person to see how they use it. <clears throat> see how they move around in the bathroom. See how they move around in the bedroom and the kitchen. Look and see whether um, they have uh, access to lighting switches before they get out of bed or go into dark rooms, things like that. For people of significant mobility limitations, we often um, put kind of, what would you call it, a control center next to where they spend most of their time and put their cell phone and the other things they really need, something to drink, the control for the TV right next to them. So um, in our day, uh, if we're not physically present, um, we can try to make sure that the phone and laptop are within their reach. And we can ask them to talk about um, whether their mobility is creating problems that we might be able to help with. So again, we could go on and on here, but that's it for right now. Um, <clears throat> so I'll do one more and then we're going to stop and talk some more. We're just about done. One more slide, please, Diana. So in the big picture, I was thinking about our caring community and perhaps the care team that um, what we're trying to do is um, support people, uh, reduce vulnerability where we can, promote reserve and resilience, both physically and psychologically. And um, I understand that um, UUFSMA is already doing a lot. So this is just me brainstorming about things. And I was thinking in addition to discussion groups, could we do more of shared exercise groups or dance groups? And Francoise, I was thinking we should pay Fernando to teach Latin dancing in a Zoom for all of us. I think it might be fun to have a sing-along and have, again, um, you know, it's very uh, emotionally rewarding, fun. People can teach each other their favorite songs. Um, you know, a lot of games are cognitively challenging. I love Scrabble. You know, we have this um, online words with friends. We should have a UUFSMA Scrabble tournament. Um, book clubs. Um, I think um, crafts and other activities uh, are um, very good ways to um, both improve um, cognition as well as various um, physical things. There's a lot of them. Um, I was thinking about how we're dealing with people who don't have internet or devices and whether we can get used ones or is there anything we can do? Because I do think the difference between being able to see someone in a FaceTime and just have a phone call um, is very important. And I know we're thinking about this, uh, but it, I think it's really important to think of vulnerable people as very much whole human beings who probably also want to be useful and not just cared for. Uh, and um, as we develop ideas um, for uh, what all of us can do to make a contribution, I think that's an important part of our mission. I'm almost done. Let's see. Okay, we can just go one more. One more slide. So uh, Diana sent out this thing. Uh, we put a fancy name on it because they said resources were too boring. So um, there are a bunch of URLs that have suggestions for working with people with hearing, vision, cognitive, and mobility challenges and a bunch of samples of commonly used assessments. I mentioned some of them, there's some others. I don't think as part of our service to each other that I would ever say you should go test the people you're working with. Um, but I think it might give you ideas about things that you could observe in your normal interactions that might um, be indicators of physical and mental well-being. And so now, we're at a point where um, we can love to hear other 
people's experience and recommendations for managing people with hearing, vision, mobility, cognitive problems, or ask me questions or anything else you want. I wanted to ask a question. Um, I am working with an elderly man who's 91 who has hearing problems. He just lost his sight uh, from glaucoma and macular degeneration, which was a real shock to him. And uh, he is having some pretty severe uh, problems with dementia. And so I have been using, uh, he's also a jazz musician uh, and singer. So he's a very uh, wonderful client to work with, very interesting. And uh, I'm just, uh, I really have been working with him to try to get him to use his knowledge of songs and music uh, to try to help him with his uh, dementia. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that more that I can do or research than I can find more information about how to help him, that kind of stuff. You know, there's a whole discipline called music therapy that I yes, think I know. wonderful people. And I do think that you could look there specifically for suggestions. Um, um, some things, um, you know, depending on what he enjoys about music. Um, so, you know, he may, um, for example, enjoy um, um, doing things like drumming or rhythm-based things, even if um, he can't, for example, see some of the things he would want to see to, um, depends on what instrument he plays, things like that. I assume he's not deaf, he's just hard of hearing. Yeah, he's, he, uh, he doesn't play an instrument, he only sings, but he has been able to recall uh, full, uh, a complete song that he sang and made a YouTube of that's on one of his CDs. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, there, when you talk to him, uh, he can't remember people's names or the names of... Players. Yeah, sometimes when you get someone started on something they used to know, they keep going. In nursing homes, we see uh, you start a song and, and, you know, people who hardly talk will sing a whole song. I uh, have worked with several people who, when they were, uh, before they had dementia, they were accomplished pianists, and they, um, they're they quite demented, but you sit them in front of a piano and they play, because the, it's in there. I, I play piano, and um, sometimes I can sit, and I don't remember a piece, but if my hands start, they'll keep going. So, um, you know, I think I think you're right that Finding things he enjoys is a key part of that. So I see we have some other. Francois, are you? Um, you're in charge of. Oh, well, how to do um, I just had a, uh, a message from Judy Jenya who wanted to get the handout. So I told her I would send it to her. Um, so there should be a PowerPoint and the PowerPoint you've seen most of, um, but anybody who wants that is welcome to that. Um, I see a whole bunch of things in the chat box. I don't know what they all say. Uh, no, it's just uh, Judy, Judy Jenya, do you want to talk and explain? Well, okay, uh, thank you. Hi. Hi, that was very interesting. I just wanted to say along these things we're talking about right now, I had viral encephalitis and um, as, as a result of that, I was in a coma and then I came out of the coma and had total amnesia. And for six months, I didn't know who I was or anybody else. But I did remember every song I'd ever learned and I sang. So when something came up, I mean, people would talk to me and I didn't know what they were talking about. I'd just break out into song. And I uh, obviously it's amazing, yeah. yeah. Uh, in another part of the brain, but it is. And I think people remember the song from their youth and their childhood and everything. And and I used to be an art therapist and a visual art therapist, but worked with music therapists. And p 
people can hum, they can sing, they can use all these other senses that is not necessarily the intellect per se. So we, we are also open if anyone has questions, uh, wants follow-up yeah, on any Chris topics. Chris Chase wanted to talk. Chris Chase. Chris? Thank you. I just want to bring to everyone's attention my last day with Doris Rogers and how it was sad that it took me until the very end of her life to realize how much joy I was able to bring to her by using my cell phone to play many songs. Doris was really into music all her life. And it really opened my eyes to see, and I know Karen Woolhouse has been on this call. I don't know if she still is, but we tried with another person, Betty Jett, to use technology again to help her. Uh, it was very important to Betty Jett to be able to have as many books as possible. And that meant that I was having to go to the library and take a lot of books on uh, CDs out each time. And it occurred to me, well, wait a minute. I could have her start using a cell phone that I'm not using to get Wi-Fi to start listening to books. And unfortunately, we didn't get very far. Her, Karen's husband was trying to use Alexa as an option. And that would have been much better because the Spanish speaking person who was her 24 seven caregiver really couldn't get it together to be able to access the books that were available via the cell phone. But gosh, I think when Stephanie, you challenge us to say, start having many different options available for people, we really need to see what we can do about funding because we had a couple of people we were concerned that they couldn't use a regular clock anymore. And we were trying to figure out how do we get a clock that they'll be able to read. But funding was an obstacle. And I would really like us to challenge ourselves to try to put a little budget together to continue to try to help these people who have sight limitations and reading limitations, to try to make it available, especially since a lot of their caregivers do not speak English. They really depend on that mental stimulation of having books that they can understand, et cetera. So, and um, if they don't have laptops, I've been wondering if the minister's fund or something like that, we could get some of those little readers, Kindles, you know, they they do audio and you can play audible.com and book reading. And those things cost what, like 60 bucks each? They're not hundreds of thousand dollars. Um, you know, so I'd be happy to help contribute to a little stash of Kindles. I guess the problem is the household has to have Wi-Fi. And I don't really have a sense of whether some of our vulnerable um, members don't even have internet access. But the kind of thing we could brainstorm about. Exactly. I think we need to come to see our mission in a different way than we have seen it. Because <clears throat> we have the technological knowledge if we can easily match it with the funding source to make these people's last years much better than sitting at home rotting, you know? <laughs> so I think in addition to sympathy and caring, which are invaluable, I, I think we can see ourselves as an enablers of moments of joy and pleasure. So we're not just there to make sure you're not in trouble. We're looking for 
ways to help people enjoy their life as much as possible. Uh, Francois, did you, I can't tell if you were trying. Yeah, uh, there's no other question in the chat box. Uh, Linda, Linda, did you Soren, want to talk? Linda Soren has her hand raised. Oh, okay, Linda, yes. No sound, are you on mute? Linda. I'm unmuted. Okay, now I'm okay. unmuted. No, I just wanted to add to Chris's suggestion about um, the audio, about schools or computers. It's possible to borrow audible books from public libraries for free. So if somebody is um, homebound and um, their caregiver can help them, they can just use their an application called Overdrive and Libby, and you can borrow free books from the public library. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, in terms of the people that are giving direct care, uh, what I'm hearing is that they're providing care for people that are living independently, or what is the circumstance that your context is? Uh, most, most caregivers who are giving direct care, by definition, the person is not independent because they need care. So I'm not quite sure what you mean, but almost everyone that needs care is because they are unable to manage themselves and their households on their own. Okay, so let me let me be more specific. So they are continuing in their home and the caregiver is living with them 24 seven or there's somebody else that's there 24 seven and the caregiver um, comes in at various times. What I'm trying to discern what the setup here. I know what happens at CLE to Linda and some other centers. So I'm just trying to. Yeah, I, well, if people have enough money and want to, they can have helpers around the clock. So there's every level, you know, in, in the States, people could have an aide that comes in a couple times a week. They could have someone who's there most days. They could have shifts. Uh, depends on what resources you have. So there, you don't have to be in an institution to have a caregiver. Um, you, you can be anything. And I, I think it's probably more affordable in Mexico than in the States. I mean, in the States, you can't get in-home help for much under 15 to 20 bucks an hour. So um, it's quite daunting to afford um, in the States. Well, I, I'm thinking about what we're actually doing here and what's happening in San Miguel, which is something I looked at for a few years before I came to San Miguel. So, for example, I had a neighbor I met on her 93rd birthday. Uh, she loved to read. She wrote, she read from 10 o'clock in the evening until 3 o'clock in the morning every single day. And her behavior started to go downhill very quickly. Uh, she didn't want to have an MRI. It later turned out she had a brain tumor. Um, so she got what she wanted. She wanted to go quickly and she had a good life to the end. But she um, had was able to have 24 hour care here. And uh, she her total income was 900 a month. And she also had her doctor regular visits. At one point he put her on oxygen to maintain her muscle tone, not because she was having breathing problems. And so I've seen this happen. It's just the people have the right sources. So I guess a couple of things that I heard people discussing caused me to think that they were tending to somebody actually living here in their own personal space in San Miguel. And uh, I was just curious about how that was working currently in San Miguel. Uh, USA is a whole different, whole different uh, deal. I understand that completely. Okay. So is there anyone directly giving uh, care to somebody here in San Miguel that they've already brought up in discussion? For example, well, the care team does not do direct care but the care team is involved with people who have arrangements for extensive care. And I believe you can give information about how to access those services. Is that right, Francoise, in terms of the care team's role? 
yeah, we, we sort of supplement the uh, full-time or whatever part-time caregiver who might be taking care of someone. We maybe will come and make a daily visit or bring some food or uh, do an errand and so on. We are not really full, full-time caregivers or even part-time caregivers. Thank you all for participating and sharing with us today. And thanks to Francoise and Diana for doing this. Um, if anyone uh, has other feedback, questions, comments uh, for me or Francoise, uh, please email us. I think you have our email addresses. Diana was going to share them. If you have suggestions about other programs you think the care team ought to sponsor, it should let Francoise know uh, there's areas uh, that you'd like to see expanded that we did too briefly. Let us know. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Gracias.